thank you very much. Uh, my hearty, hearty thanks, uh, Alex Chu and everyone at IIEA uh, for having me here. Uh, I have to give a few bits of special thanks uh, to Kathy O'Connor, previously of the uh, Irish Embassy in the United States, now of uh, DCENR, uh, uh, Jill Donahue of the Institute, who tendered the first invitation to me to come give a talk such as this uh, something well over three years ago, uh, to both of them for their persistence uh, in helping to make this happen, and for Paula Higgins in particular for her great help in making the logistics work and magically tacking it on uh, to the end of a family holiday. Uh, there was a group of 18 of us that set off from Dublin uh, last two Saturdays ago and have done the roundabout of the whole republic stopping in a number of places. If you missed us, you're lucky. It was quite a crazy gaggle. I don't. We weren't quite thrown out of any places, but I think it was close now and then. <laughs> But we had a wonderful time. Um, what I thought I would do in my formal remarks is, is pretty simple. Uh, I thought I'll give you just a bit of an overview of the agency I'm in charge of, our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Uh, our, we have a mission that truly and literally extends from the surface of the sun to the bottom of the sea. Uh, and so it touches many of the issues that the Institute cares about and engages in. We tend to touch those as I tend to refer to us as the hot plate underneath all the pots on the stove where the data, where the predictions, where the information that's going to guide or shape uh, countless choices made by our Department of Energy or our Environmental Protection Agency or our, um, our State Department. Uh, so I'll do that a little bit. Uh, I was going to drive a little bit more deeply on four more cross-cutting topics to give you a sense of issues we're working on, ways we're thinking about them. Uh, based on our luncheon conversation, I think there's some healthy intersections between the ones I've picked and points of interest uh, for the Institute as well and then, as, the, as our event chair said, shift to questions. So on to the show. That just says that that's what I was going to do. Uh, and the four topics I thought I would touch on are the, the, the challenge and the opportunity and benefits of scientifically closing the weather climate gap. I'll tell you what that means, but it's, it's a no man's land where our predictive skill is currently something between very low and lacking. Um, oceans and climate services, relationships between those, uh, the, the water imperative and how we're addressing that within my agency and across the United States government, and, uh, and then an emerging issue that I'm involved in both domestically uh, with NOAA and internationally as the United States representative to the group on Earth observation, uh, something that's coming about as technology diff diffuses, as the value of information, uh, the economic impact of information becomes clearer and clearer, the prospect of, uh, of moving away from the many decades regime in which basic measurements of the Earth, weather measurements, ocean measurements, are treated as public goods freely exchanged at no cost among research agencies, private citizens, whoever might like them. Uh, anyone can build an app, a business, a prediction on top of that public platform, perhaps changing those into privatized goods that are owned by an individual or a company uh, and are for sale, are monetized at, at the source. So, so NOAA. Uh, our mission, as I said, uh, scientifically, truly, does extend from the surface of the sun uh, to the bottom of the sea. We are the Space Weather Prediction Authority, the Civilian Space Weather Prediction Authority for the United States. We manage uh, the saltwater fisheries, marine fisheries for the United States. Uh, we, are, we are the extended continental shelf mapping entity for the United States. So it is a tremendously broad mandate. That's the realm we're charged with knowing about and monitoring and, and measuring and developing the ability to predict uh, future states, but our purpose is a mixture of science and services and stewardship. So our, as the National Weather Service, one of our units is the United States National Weather Service. Uh, our charge is best exemplified there to understand and predict changes in the climate variables, in the weather day to day, out to 10, 12 days, uh, in oceanic conditions, uh, in uh, water resources. Uh, not to hoard the information, but to disseminate that through the United States, uh, other agencies, as well as broadly to the public and to international partners, a number of uh, key partners here in this room, from the head of your survey to the Marine Institute. Uh, and then we do have a, st a regulatory and stewardship set of responsibilities with respect to marine fisheries. Uh, the United States Network of National Marine Sanctuaries are designated and operated by NOAA. Uh, we work with another department in our government uh, to manage some of the national marine monuments that, uh, that presidents have declared. 
Uh, our vision for the work we're doing is really centers around resilience, to provide, to make sure we're providing the information and services that help communities, businesses, the economy, and the environment itself remain resilient and healthy over the long haul of time. So that can be the simple task of knowing to take an umbrella and a heavier coat this morning to not get too cold, uh, running for shelter from a tornado or a severe storm and protecting a family, when to batten down the buildings along the coastal zone if there's a hurricane coming in. So from that hazard space that we all sort of know a bit about how to respond to, out to longer time frames and to uh, less, if you will, less tangible, uh, less tangible issues. And these thumbnails graphics here suggest that. So I said we are the Civilian Space Weather Prediction Authority. That's sort of the scientific angle of it. But knowing what sort of bursts of energy the sun is, is blasting towards the Earth is really quite critical to any industry that depends on GPS, which is not just your airline, by the way. Uh, uh, precision agriculture depends on GPS. So a lot of you know, highways and tunneling are now using GPS for their detailed surveying. Um, power grids, the picture shown there, uh, when the earth, when the sun belches at the earth, it sends forth billions of tons of matter and charged particles and chunks of its magnetic field. And, and that energy, as it hits the earth's magnetic field, can induce currents in long metallic things like transmission lines or pipelines. Uh, and if not protected and thought about, you can blast, blow out a transformer, big transformers, that will take months to replace. Uh, so, the, And this is a hazard that can affect a full hemisphere of the Earth at once, depending which side of the Earth happens to be facing towards the sun when the blast hits. Um, coastal communities from healthy coasts, um, safe beach water that doesn't have toxic algae in it, surf conditions, those everyday things, on up to the viability of the coastal ecosystems that are often the nursery grounds and the rearing grounds for commercial fish stocks, facilitating sustainable agriculture, fisheries, and um, and aquaculture in the upper right, uh, supporting transportation and commerce. Uh, one of the things we do under a heading we call coastal environmental intelligence is we put the instrumenta instrumentation packages in place in US ports and harbors that let uh, skippers of ships as large as that one know, you know to within inches how much water is beneath their keel right now, right here, this channel, at this time, with the tide, with the wind, is the wind at my back, is the wind at my head, do I have a following sea, do I have a beam sea, and how much air is above my head, the radio masts that stick up if I'm going under a bridge, do I have clearance above and clearance below? There's a clear economic uh, efficiency driver there if you're the owner of that vessel or of the cargo, uh, but if you're the port captain, there's another one, because if, you know, if that vessel, if this vessel grounds leaving Los Angeles Harbor, then a harbor that does about 10, what's the number, 20, 25 million dollars an hour uh, in throughput grinds to a halt until you can clear that channel and, and unfoul the bridge. So the efficiency, but also the, the uh, durability of commerce. Um, our information provides a lot of support for business opportunities. It's actually a small business in Maine uh, that's developing foodstuffs out of uh, farmed algae and kelp, uh, protecting life and property through our National Weather Service, and to an increasing degree informing energy decisions where, where are the most viable areas for either solar or wind-produced energy. So those, we're, I liken us to being like the knot in a bow tie. There's the entire world of science over here, understand the Earth because it's fascinating, and it should be valuable to understand the Earth, and the entire world of, let me call them clinical needs, businesses and people and communities that need information or, or could well use information about the weather or the ocean or the currents or the fisheries. And we sit at the middle knowledgeable about these needs and capable scientifically of pulling the information and the, the research together to produce some usable information that's actionable and timely to the people facing those decisions. And we call that product, that information product, environmental intelligence. So it's not just a science paper. That's not environmental intelligence. I can hardly use a scientific paper in a journal anymore. None of us could make good use of that for a daily decision. It's that transformation of the scientific knowledge and understanding with real-time, robust measurements and observations of the planet into the actionable and timely information. And then the next bit is to be knowledgeable or attuned to what your decision-making framework is 
and be thinking about the thresholds or parameters that most condition your decisions. To give you an example of that, um, Craig Fugate is the man responsible at the federal level for emergency management in the United States. We make the hurricane forecasts. What's most, what should we do next scientifically? Should we try to get the accuracy of our track forecast from 97% to 98.2%? Should we try to get it from day five or six out to seven or eight or nine? Uh, you know, scientifically, my scientists would love to drive that curve to the you know, right towards 100% and right towards perfect accuracy. But when we go talk to Craig Fugate, what he will say is, look, at day four, four days before a landfall, I start having to make decisions. I'm gonna put my emergency squad somewhere, I'm gonna start warning this community to prepare for evacuations and shutting down businesses, I'm gonna decide not to warn that community, or I'm gonna have to decide to include them. You know, many thousands of people's lives, millions of dollars, time, effort, all is going to start adjusting and being deployed based on day four. So what I would like most is that you give me for not 82%, but 84%, 85% at day four. I could care less what you can do at seven, eight, or nine. Might be scientifically amusing, not what I need. And so we drive our environmental intelligence towards those sorts of thresholds. And we do that across all of the sectors uh, that I just touched on. So I, I just wanna hammer home a little more the, the elements behind environmental intelligence. We live on an extraordinarily dynamic planet. It, it is imperative that we take the pulse of the planet continually. Uh, these information needs will never be purely data mining exercises, since you measured it once, just run the statistics again, and you'll get the insight that you need. So observations are critical. All of this rests on a foundation, a storehouse of decades worth of research into how the Earth itself works, so that we can relate the data, the measurements we're making to actual processes. And then, of course, rests on uh, advanced mathematical modeling and advanced computing techniques that let us cr literally crunch all that data and calculate the future state of the planet on appropriate scales from global uh, down, to, uh, down to regional. That, that is what it takes and then the goal in terms of understanding the decision framework to be sure the information you're providing is, is timely to the decision, is pertinent to the decision and is, and is actionable. It's getting at the action parameters of the person uh, or the, the group that has to make a decision. And in this era that we're in already, uh, and that certainly lies ahead, uh, the need for and value of environmental intelligence is, is only increasing. Certainly the demands coming at my agency are going up you know, much more rapidly than, than is our ability uh, to meet them. Um, so you see, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but the, the variables that we are seeing change around us uh, already are really rather imperative. Changing rain and snowfall patterns, just in the United States, for example, um, we've seen uh, between th times three and times nine increase in nuisance flooding in our coastal zones. That's a combination of coastal storms, stronger storms, and changing rainfall patterns. So uh, city streets that never used to flood now flood at a routine high tide, not a high tide plus a storm. Th times three to times nine increase in that in many communities around the United States. Uh, temperatures and shifts in the extremes. Uh, we've seen um, in the southeast United States, we're looking at uh, trends that are heading towards having 20 to 50 more days that are at the 95 degree level or higher, that are as, as hot as the top 10% of days have been in the past 30 years, going up by you know, th that sort of a number. Uh, the number of warm days that we're seeing in the United States uh, in that 10% range has gone up by a factor of two since the 1970s. And the cooler cold nights the nighttime low temperatures, th those are becoming less common. So days are getting warmer, the nights are not becoming as cool. Uh, and that puts a cumulative heat stress on humans and on our built environment, and in terms of um, affecting insect patterns and, and potentially disease patterns, the lack of a deep chill overnight uh, and the length of frost seasons really play a role in the natural environment around us. All of that is changing 
around us in many, many ways, and the imperative of being able to tune our environmental intelligence to help us think ahead and plan ahead and prepare for these changing trains, trends is only rising. It is a great graphic that starts, you'll see a spiral growing out from that center bit with each segment of the spi spiral changing color by decade and shows you how the global average temperature has been changing uh, from 1850 to March of 2016. So I'd encourage you to look up um, global temperature spiral on Climate Central and, and take a look at it. So we know, we know are very much involved in uh, President Obama's climate action plan. Uh, I know a number of organizations in the room have ties to our Department of Energy, which plays a key role on uh, transforming the energy sector. And of course, our Environmental Protection Agency is the group uh, in the U.S. charged with the, that's taking the role on clean power plants and the regulatory side of carbon management. Our role is really on the adaptation and mitigation side. It's on providing the information that helps us know what's coming ahead uh, and working with communities and companies to help them uh, factor those realities into their own plans. Uh, and so here, here's a little more of how we're doing that. Uh, starting, of course, first with measurements. Uh, NOAA has, operates a fleet of nine aircraft, 16 research ships. Uh, we maintain an array of ocean buoys and coastal buoys uh, on our own and in partnership with other organizations through the United States and internationally from the Tropical Pacific Observing Array that is critical to forecasting El Nino conditions, similar arrays in the Atlantic Ocean and the Indian Ocean, coastal arrays from Alaska down through uh, South America. Uh, this is this one here on the center right is a tsunami buoy. This is a the top level of a pressure gauge that's on the bottom of the ocean that can, in 14,000 feet of water, can detect a wave that's about that high, which is about as high as the tsunami is before it comes near shore. So flagged by the seismic monitors, these guys are watching and listening all the time and allow us to give communities warning about, uh, about um, tsunamis. Uh, a bevy of satellites in orbit, and you see in the lower left there uh, the research station we have at the South Pole. We run six atmospheric baseline observatories that just make the basic background global atmospheric chemistry measurements. What's in the atmosphere in places where it's well mixed and not contaminated directly by urban areas. So the measurements are critical. Uh, process research. Uh, we've got a new uh, geostationary satellite going up in October uh, that will give us the resolution that we have on the right. Uh, compared to what we've got in orbit right now for NOAA, this is going to be like our television jumping from black and white to full color high definition in one great leap. Uh, it'll give us five times faster data with four times greater detail uh, and just really enable our, especially our tornado and other severe weather forecasters uh, to really improve their skill on those uh, killer events. So then process research, as I said, we have to understand how the Earth itself works. How is heat exchanged between the sea and the land? How is momentum exchanged between the atmosphere and the ocean? How do winds and waves and currents work? Uh, decades worth of that from, the again, the fundamental chemistry of the atmosphere to the physics of different processes. Uh, we have about a $600 million research portfolio, about 60% of which we invest in academic uh, institutions around the United States. United States and sometimes internationally to drive this research, and we're part of a number of research collaborations that many of you are involved in, because again, this has to be a global enterprise for any of us to have the scientific capability that we're going to need. Uh, we're charged also with keeping the official records and statistics for the United States. We are our National Climate Data Center and Geophysical Data Centers and so on. Uh, maintain those, run the statistics, uh, provide the calibrations, and again, make them available publicly uh, to other agencies, to the general public. Uh, and interestingly, the climate stats are very frequently used by lawyers in uh, accident cases and personal injury cases. Uh, assessments. Uh, our scientists have played pivotal roles in all of the IPCC global assessments, uh, and we're the agency that uh, superintends the National Climate Assessment, which is done every four years uh, in the United States. This is one of the vehicles by which you pull all the scientific information together and translate it into more tangible terms for the general public. So for example, one of the findings in the most recent climate assessment is given the current trends of sea level rise that we're seeing has been about uh, 
eight inches over the last uh, 60 years. Uh, given that rate of sea level rise, if you project that forward, the United States will have something between 66 and $106 billion of capital assets, either underwater or at grave risk in our coastal zones by 2050. Uh, that's something to be paying some attention to. Uh, we did this sort of work for New York and New Jersey after Hurricane Sandy on the bottom right where you could, to uh, let the public planners actually be able to see what the flooding levels will be under different storm uh, and sea level rise conditions. We don't make their risk decisions, they make their risk decisions, but how can you give them some information to help them get a clearer handle of what level of risk they're exposed to and where, where will they hedge their bet? Where, where are they going to set their risk quotient? Drought outlooks, convective outlooks, hurricane tracks, um, quite a continuum of things on scales from minutes from now to decades from now. Uh, those are the sorts of services that we produce as well. So let's jump into a couple of those, uh, those other topics. Um, the weather climate gap, from a scientific point of view, uh, weather simply means dynamic phenomena in the atmosphere from right now out to about 14 days. That's the weather time scale. And of course, our level of interest in that tends to be within about a 20-foot radius of where I am, right? That's what we would all like to know. Uh, and that is an initial values problem. You measure the state of the atmosphere and you actually compute it forward out 24, 48, 72 hours. The other scale is climate. So those, those same variables, temperature, precipitation, and so forth, over longer time scales, years to seasons to years to decades. Uh, that's a boundary condition problem. If you have a spinning sphere exposed to a sun and it's got this much heat capacity, there's only a certain range of conditions that it can, uh, it can turn to over any period of time. And right now, scientifically, we've got pretty good skill in making weather forecasts uh, out certainly into the one to two week range. There are a few organizations that are beginning to develop some skill in the three to four week range. And climate outlooks tend to be out on the scale of ecosystems and the whole environment at decades or 50 years or more. And the spatial scale that we can provide them at varies accordingly. If I only have to compute five days of the whole Earth, I can give you a one to three kilometer model. You have to compute the whole Earth in multiple time steps for 100 years, it's going to be a 30 or 50 or 100 kilometer square. Not very useful for practical decisions. The trick is right now the science doesn't close in that middle ground, yet that's where a tremendous array of important size societal and economic decisions would be. What's the three month, six month outlook going to be for farming, for agricult agriculture generally? What's the th one, three, five year outlook going to be? We'd have a lot to do with longer range economic planning, water resource planning, and right now there's this, we can't make those bridge scientifically uh, to provide skillful forecasts in that range. Uh, we and our National Science Foundation uh, have mounted a number of efforts to try to close that. We have some good ideas what the scientific linchpins likely are, uh, but that's scientific work in progress that uh, obviously will be important to society over the next three to five years and beyond. So that's in work, trying to move out to those longer time frames. Those predictions won't be like your weather forecast. They'll be much more probabilistic. It is likely that Ireland in the next three years will see up to a 30% decline in precipitation. I made all of that up. But you know, it would be that sort of thing, or it's at, at an X percent likelihood, it would be some gradation of a probabilistic forecast rather than a deterministic forecast. This is just to give you a sense of the spatial scales involved from a, that's a, one of our uh, fairly high resolution weather models on the left, looking at sort of the, new, the Washington, Baltimore area and the Appalachian Mountains in the upper right. Uh, there's a climate model grid of the same. You can see how little of the actual topography or region that it gives you a clear picture of. It doesn't resolve those details at that scale. How can we get into that middle ground uh, on time and space is one of those scientific and computational challenges. Uh, by the way, the world of supercomputing is going to change radically within the next seven or so years. And we, and I see my friend from Metaron nodding as well, we're all trying to figure out how we scale our current computational capabilities to that era. It's uh, going to be quite a trick. Um, moving to the oceans, uh, we're facing quite a series uh, of global ocean challenges. Uh, oceans are showing clear signs of warming since at least the middle of last century, uh, about a little over a tenth of a degree per de Fahrenheit per decade since the beginning 
beginning of the past century, 1901, eight inch rise in sea levels globally since reliable records began to be kept in 1980. Uh, fishing pressures, we're making some bits of progress uh, on overfishing in the United States. The number of US stocks that's overfished has, has dropped by two thirds since 2000, but if you take the global look, still uh, 30 to 30% of global fisheries are either overexploited or depleted or still in the trench recovering from depletion. Our oceans absorb uh, at least a quarter of the CO2 in the atmosphere, so they're becoming more acidic, and that's beginning to pose real problems for the lower levels of the uh, oceanic food chain, which of course we depend on critically as well. Uh, it's you know, the ocean is that big blue thing off the coast when you stand there and take your postcard picture. Uh, but it is also the ocean, and it's really critical to remember, the ocean gives us every other breath of oxygen we take. The ocean is our personal life support system. Uh, it regulates, it's what buffers our weather and our climate. It provides a, a sixth, just shy of 20% of the animal protein consumed globally. Uh, and as I said, it absorbs a quarter to a third of the CO2 emitted. So the health of the ocean is absolutely critical to the health of, of our society, and it's changing in many, many, many ways. There's a lot of discussion these days in, in national and international policy circles about um, the blue economy, and in most quarters, uh, that refers to uh, the extended continental shelf, shelf claims that countries can make under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, and each country's recognition that that opens up new swaths of the seabed and new portions of the ocean waters for fishing and mining and other extractive uh, purposes. And if you go internationally, you'll find discussions of the blue economy are very strongly, predominantly extractive. It's the next frontier to industrial industrialize uh, and to extract from. Uh, we're championing a different look at that notion uh, from within NOAA, uh, and that is, hence the word new here, uh, and that's to try to be a counterweight to this solely extractive focus. Uh, and put a reminder on, uh, put a reminding lens on the fact that the health of our ocean ecosystems and the data, the knowledge, the measurements we have about the ocean are comparably critical uh, to society as well. These are, you know, instrumenting the ocean as we've done along our ports and harbors, for example, is a tremendous way to de-risk investments in port infrastructure and in cargo and shipping. Uh, the kind of knowledge about the ocean we get from the tropical Pacific buoys enable seasonal forecasts casting of El Nino uh, rainfall and, and temperature conditions. It's a tremendous way to de-risk food supply. The government of India uses NOAA's climate forecast system model to look out towards their next monsoon season. It, it can give them about a 20, 25% signal that they're likely to not have a monsoon. It can't give them the opposite signal. I'm, I assure you at 20, 30% you will have. But it can tell them, I'm 25% confident you're not going to have a good monsoon. Well, if they don't have a monsoon, they don't have a wheat crop. And if they don't have a wheat crop, they have a massive starvation problem. If they wait until the monsoon fails to show up to discover that, the world has noticed the monsoons have failed. Wheat prices have already spiked. And the government of India now cannot afford to go out to the commodities market and buy enough wheat to, to solve the problem. So they're using our climate model to look 90, 100 days down the road. And even though it's only 25% or so confidence, and even though it only can say, I don't think you're going to, it can't say, I'm sure you will, they use that as a hedging factor. And if they get that negative sign, they go to the commodities market, they hedge their risk by buying some food preemptively before the prices spike uh, to cover their bet, basically. So that, and that capability depends critically on data from the ocean. You cannot get climate variables. You will never have any kind of skillful climate prediction unless you're literally taking the temperature of the ocean. And we're not doing nearly enough of that now to really drive the kind of skill that we need um, further out in time and to close the weather and climate gap. So we're going to try to advocate that, not that nations will give up or yield their economic extractive interests in either seabed mining or fishing, but as governments make their commitment to investments or to capitalizing those sectors, to also be mindful of the importance of capitalizing the research investment and capitalizing the observations investment, uh, both for their own economic well-being and the global well-being. Uh, and finally, uh, water. 
this is clearly going to be one of the emerging issues and risks uh, of our times. It's uh, On one level, it's a dead simple one, and on another level, it's just completely devilish. It's, look, water boils down to a simple problem. There's too much, or there's too little, or it's in the wrong place, or it's not the quality you need. Easy, right? Uh, but it weaves through everything as we know. The World Economic Forum ranks uh, water as, and potential water crises as the, their highest long-term global concern. In the United States, our National Intelligence Council uh, has, has assessed that water problems will drive political instability, state failure, and regional tensions. It is, in fact, already doing that. Read Libya, read Syria. Uh, the United Nations has forecast that 1.8 billion people will face absolute water scarcity by 2025. Depleted groundwater, insufficient precipitation, absolute scarcity. And interestingly, the World Bank declares that water uh, will lower gross domestic product in some parts of the world by as much as 6% by mid-century. Find me a government that won't quake in its boots over a 6% decline in GDP. Uh, but find me one that realizes it might be coming at you through water resources. That's uh, a new recognition that's going to be of great significance. Uh, NOAA's role in this uh, uh, chimes in with what I've said so far. It's about the understanding and the measurements and the predictive capability. And so we're working, uh, we do the river forecast operations for the United States now, uh, but what we really have recognized we need is to get at a water nexus. You need water to produce food. You need water to produce energy. Uh, you need water to sustain the natural environment. You need water for direct human consumption. All four of those uses are intensifying. All four are tugging on the same drop of water. And yet we have some water monitoring and prediction capability f around the energy sector or around the ag sector or around the hazard sector and, and not the kind of integrated water data and water prediction that it's going to take for us as a, as a policy matter to be able to see all those competing uses and recognize where we're going to have tensions or conflicts or balance issues. So we're, we're, we see ourselves as sitting right here in the integrate the open water data and prediction. Uh, we've launched a national water center uh, just last year that's got several other federal agencies uh, and our academic partners co-located. Uh, our National Science Foundation is also moving out to probe the water food energy nexus from a science and policy and human behavior side. Uh, I was part of the team that established a, a White House level senior coordinating council on the water food energy nexus that will carry on under our Committee on Environment, Natural Resources, and Sustainability, which reports uh, directly to the science advisor, to our president. So uh, that's sort of in the preview of coming attractions. Uh, arena. Uh, we've just working now this summer to shift the forecast framework that we use at NOAA from forecasting only 4,000 4, discrete points to forecasting for the United States at 2.7 uh, points and along the continuum of our rivers so we can get at real-time flow. And finally, privatizing environmental data. Um, the uh, Science Magazine cover here on the left gives you one sense of that, and the Space News uh, flash in the middle. Um, company, it's becoming more accessible. Producing satellites, making sensors that can measure the planet is becoming uh, a more accessible thing to do economically for smaller and smaller companies. So we, like your Met service, we don't build the instruments we need to measure the, the weather parameters. We buy them from companies like Vaisal and others. Uh, we don't personally build the satellites we fly. We've hired companies like Lockheed or Boeing to produce the satellites. But they've been United States satellites, paid for by the taxpayer. And so the data that flow from them are publicly available globally to anyone. Now that satellites are becoming as small as that little gizmo uh, shown in this, this Science Magazine cover, which is much smaller than this podium, uh, there are companies beginning to look at uh, shrinking some weather sensors to fit on those and financing that privately. So they would own the data from the satellite. And their business model would be they're going to sell that to Met that on. They're going to sell that to UK Met. They're going to sell that to Meteo France. They're going to sell that to NOAA. Um, and maybe make arrangements for researchers. Who knows? Uh, I don't know. I don't pretend to know where this goes. But uh, the proposition we've all worked within since the dawn of the space age and really since the dawn of modern day weather forecasting and climate forecasting has been a simple one. No one can make, no, no company, no person, no academic, no country can make all of the measurements of the globe that it takes 
to have any of this capacity for prediction. So we each make what we can and we coordinate to be complementary to each other and we pool that all. We treat the data as global public goods and they're public goods, anyone can have them. A uh, student at Trinity that wants to create a new app for your phone for weather can just go grab the dollop of data and do that, no barrier to entry. Uh, it's been an op the data are treated as an open innovation platform. In the United States, that's led to a $7 billion per annum private sector weather enterprise that tailors information and tailors applications based off of the core work that the public sector does. This is showing this may be ch might be changing quite radically and frankly quite rapidly uh, in the years ahead. There is a draft bill pending in our legislature uh, that would direct NOAA to not extend or continue any programs of record if there's any sign that a private sector entity could step in and uh, do that themselves. Uh, not taking too much care for what the ownership properties of the data would be. CubeSats, as I said, are getting smaller. And IBM just recently acquired one of the companies, one of the major companies in that $7 billion private sector enterprise, an outfit called the Weather Company, which owned the Weather Channel and Weather Underground and WSI and several other B2B and B2Consumer and television <coughs> entities. IBM has bought that at a handsome price. They've left the television channel behind. They don't care about the television channel. They want the data, they want the consumer base, uh, and it's partnered now in their Watson and Cognitive Computing Group. Uh, they, they're explicit and clear, just all public information. They think one of the first really substantial plays in cognitive computing and big data is going to be the weather play because it touches each, each of us and it touches every company and it touches uh, so many different uses globally. So that, that deal just closed at the very beginning of this year. Uh, they're doing some very fascinating things. They don't know yet quite where they're going. Uh, but stay tuned, watch this space, uh, because I think the policy issues uh, at the national level and at the international level are going to be really challenging over the next five to seven years. Uh, as I stand here and speak to you, uh, my deputy and our assistant secretary is in Geneva speaking to the World Meteorological Organization's Executive Congress over the, uh, these sorts of changes and the, um, the legislative scene in the United States. The WMO is the group that has coordinated this international exchange of data for 170 years or something. Well, it's, it's 1951 formally, but of course the IMO preceded yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. So you know, they're watching this space very carefully as well, not sure what happens if any, any or all of these dominoes start to fall and you start playing you know, country to country tit for tat pricing uh, on the data. So that's uh, the story of our next decade in some respects. Don't. No crystal ball here. So let me stop at that point. Let's uh, open the floor for questions. Thank you.